Good morning. How are you guys? I wasn't sure if I was supposed to come up yet or not. I was a little nervous. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I was feeling really good this morning. I'm not going to lie, really good. And uh, I got out my African shirt. Jim, where you at? Stand up. Let people see. We didn't do it for nothing. It's my damn Bill. Bill? Oh, so is he do, he's security team? Where you at? Represent. Okay. With the shorts. Come on. Let's hear it. Hey. African style. Get that man a machete. We want to be protected in here. All right. Thank you for laughing. I, I need that. But anyways, I was good. I was doing good. And then Rhonda says, don't worry, our expectations are low. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, I'm five, what, five, eight, so is that like a short guy joke? I don't know. Anyways, I'm good. I'm good. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, you know, I think and hope that I love this church so much. And some of you are like, I don't know who you are. I get it. We'll, we'll love each other too when it's all said and done. And you'll really love Pastor Matt next week. So, uh, it's an honor when I get the chance to bring the Word of God, and I miss it. You, you know that we're missionaries in West Africa, and you have sent us there among the Glaro people to take the Word of God to them, to be a part of translating, doing literacy, and lesson development, and we're thankful to represent you. And so it, it's an honor to be able to give back, but I love this church so much that as I do like my, my personal devotions and things, and God is teaching me things over there, always for the last 10 years, when something like gets me, you know, God really speaks to me, I always think of you first. And I really mean that. I always have. And, uh, you know, I I probably, for the rest of my life, will. Um, Because we've shared in a lot together, you know, this church family. And there are a lot of things that that go on, and um, that's why we call it church family, right? And so I just want you to know that it thrills my heart to get the opportunity and that Kayla and I and our kids, we are so thankful for you that you would give us the honor to do that. And it's not always pretty, you know, and uh, you may not if you were there with us on the ground all the time, but God is gracious and you're a part of us being able to realize his grace in our lives. So thank you. I just want to start with that. Thank you. And um, all right, so you can clap. That's another thing I love about you guys, you clappers. When everything gets excited... I said, like, if, uh, if, like, the E3 had a football team and they won a state championship, nobody would cheer or anything. We'd just clap. We'd be like, you know, right? It's, hey. But I'll take it. That's not an insult. It's just an observation. All right? And I, I, you know, it's, you're laughing because you know it's true. I said, we're from Fulton County. We clap. All right? And on that line, before we get into the Word of God, it's, it's uh, really thrilled my heart, especially, to come back. And I call it the Cuba connection. So we got Jake. Uh, over here, Jeff, and uh, to, to expand it, going back to my North Fulton days, Jimmy from Valley, and you guys are all equally valuable to me, but it's something special about seeing what God has done in the long term, and uh, Bill is also a Cuba grad from a, a, only a slightly higher generation, but uh, how, why, why, at least no one clapped. I'll take it. But I think it's crazy that God would use two guys from such a small area of the world to go to Liberia to do his work. Isn't that wild? And you get to be part of that too. So these are just things that God has um, really done to encourage my heart on top of just being here. And so thank you for that as well. I praise God for you guys. Um, And on that line, like sometimes when we preach, or at least for me, like, I like to be like convicting, kind of like lay it on, but my heart has been so appreciative and something that God has done for me is he's brought me back to a place of realizing his goodness again. And I went through some difficult things personally in the last term. We did as a a family as well. Um, I won't go into all of it, but you know, we we lost our language helper. She died. Um, We don't even know. She may have taken her life and it's just a long, depressing story. we, we thought we had 
good ground going with a language helper, and then he, he moved out of the village on me. I found out like two days before, you know, and it's like we have just felt like, you know, when, when something gets going, something else goes wrong. You guys all heard about Levi getting hurt, and, you know, that, that broke our hearts. So we literally have, you know, left pieces of our family, you know, um, in, in this ministry, in this work, and it's been really hard for me. And I have to say that, like, generally in, in the experience that, that we've had in Africa, you know, we could write a manual on, like, what not to do. Trial and error, heavy on error. And, like, you know, God has still worked. And, but I would hope, you know, looking back after 10 years on the field, that we'd have a lot more, you know, like, exciting news to promote. Like, you know, 7,000 Glaro people got saved or something like, you know what I mean? And uh, this has not, like, been the case. And, and that's okay, but something that I had to do, and I'm still doing, is have to relearn what God is like. And I just remember thinking at some point along the way, God, like, where you at? Is this, I mean, it just, this does not seem like you. What are you actually like? Where are you? Why, why are these things happening, you know? Are you not satisfied that we came out to this lovely, you know, steamy, you guys go outside and then you, you know how it feels there all the time, you know, and just kind of like struggled on and off with having pity parties about, you know, how much I've done for God and why is it not going well. And the cool thing is, the one thing that God has really blessed me with is time each morning in his word. And I've not historically been super disciplined with that. And I've had the opportunity to relearn what he's like and through his word and through some other things, um, including you guys. And so I'm thankful for that. So my heart is not to be like a heavy convictor today. If God does that, I mean, that's his. But my heart is to lift you guys up and to encourage you. I have a thankful heart for you, and I just feel so much love for you all. And I I want God to lift you up. And I want you to leave today just with a little bit of a, a renewed grasp on what he's like. And, you know, I'll never be able to do this justice completely. But maybe one thing, one attribute that we could grab onto together to see what he's like. And so, and it's important that if we do that, that we do it from his word. Now, before we jump in, um, I was feeling pretty good when we came back from Africa, like physically. You know, I'd been working out a little bit. And so I thought it was time to bring in a mustache to family vacation, which I know is irrelevant. And I honestly was starting to believe that I was looking a little bit more towards like the Chris Bumstead side of things. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? We put that, that next photo up with my mustache. I was just feeling, <laughs> was that you? I felt that laugh. That was, <laughs> I was feeling good, doing some push-ups. And uh, so I walk out with my mustache. I should have grown one today. This is my wife, you know, and I was getting ready to go in for like a most muscular or whatever. And Kayla goes, you look like the guy from Fantastic Beasts. And if you don't know who that is, go ahead and help me out. <laughs> I shaved. That was it, was, it was hard. But the reason I bring this up wasn't just to make you laugh. It's that, like, you know, sometimes we have unrealistic ideas about what God is like and how we relate to him. And when we have the wrong idea about God and what he's like, what his character is, it's not actually, it doesn't end up being funny. It ends up being kind of gross. And, you know, it's true. I've changed. I'm 37 today, okay? And, yeah, hey, this, being with you guys is a birthday present. It's a birthday present. But I was getting a haircut this week, and I was like, you know, you know, trim up everything, make it it look good. Make me look good. I'm going to look like C-bump when I'm done. And I was, to my horror, I'm looking at the mirror and the, the razor gets about an inch and a half from my ear and I feel something. Like mean, there's hair out there coming out of my ears, you know? And so I, I've changed. <laughs> I've changed. I, I have, you know, I always thought I was hairy, but no, there's, the best is yet to come, I guess. And uh, I played soccer yesterday and I woke up this morning and I almost fell over and my foot hurts. I don't know what happened. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. Nobody did anything to me because I didn't really run. Um, <laughs> so things change. 
and I'm different than I was, and our life in Africa is different. I'm just going to show you a few photos, Brian. You can just, like, cycle through them. I'm not going to explain everything, but just, you know, life is different in Liberia than it is in Fort Wayne County, okay? And you can just let, let, the people, let the people see, you know, different. Just some things you don't see there that you would see here. And so we all struggle with that, right? We're all, we're all growing and changing, and, and life is growing and changing. We've all lived, loved, and lost. Um, yet, I would like to challenge you and encourage you today that God has not changed. He has not changed. So let's turn to Psalms 136, and let's get into the nitty-gritty here. And, you know, we will take time um, in the future. We would like to have some nights and, and share some photos and invite you guys out to see everything and, and talk about what's going on in Africa. But like you said, you can see that it's different. And I love this photo right here. It's the last one that I have, but it's Serena helping our friend Kwaku learn how to read. And uh, that's something that's been a part of our ministry, our kids helping out um, in literacy. And our heart is that what we're getting ready to do here, we're getting ready to read the Word of God, that we would be able to do that with our Glaro friends one day. And that we would have the Word of God in their language so that they could understand. And uh, that we'd be able to read and discuss together and Sharpen one another like we're getting ready to do today. So Psalms 136. And in Africa, pastors always say, if you're there, say amen. amen. All right. Hey, let it rip. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay. Now don't be shy. Or you can clap if you're there. Whatever. <laughs> That's fine too. But it says, hey, thanks for rolling with that. I love, love you guys. Psalms 136 says this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Sihon, the king of the Amorites, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, his love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Yeah. A little repetitive, but I think that we get that his love endures forever. And... um, when I started thinking about, man, what, what is God like? You know, we always have different sayings about God being good, right? God is good all the time and all the time God is good. We have different things. But it's been the goodness of God that has brought me back close to him. And it's what I want to focus on. And I want you to understand something. If you'd like to flip to Romans 120, you can. If you want to just listen, that's all right too. It says this. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And so I think about God and his goodness, and the first thing that that strikes my mind is that God has been trying to make himself known in his goodness since the creation of the world. And that's what the Bible says. So much so does that we as humans are without excuse. 
And so the first thing is I would, I would, I would just challenge is, you know, like if we feel like God's not good, just look, look around at how things function around you. And, and when it rains and fills up the wells and all this stuff that, you know, to say that God's not good, but yet, you know, the earth hasn't fallen apart yet and we're still here. And yeah, maybe our world, maybe our world has fallen apart, but according to the scripture, he's good. And he's good at creating. And that's the first part of his goodness that I wanted us to focus on. He's good at creating. Look at, look at us. I mean, you guys look good. You know, just look at us how different we are, all the different things represented here in this, just in this sanctuary. And God made us, and the Bible says in another place that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. It's one thing that I love about America is that you could like do anything you wanted to and make a living off of it if you just have the drive. Like I, I, I joke about this and I do think it's funny, but it's actually probably true. Like you could knit cat sweaters. And if you had like entrepreneurial, um, you know, qualities, you would probably make a lot of money making sweaters for cats. Uh, isn't it? I think it's money. All right. But like, you, you, you can be creative in, in, our, in our culture. And, you know, there are so many people here with different skills, you know, and, and it's incredible. And God is creative. You know, he's made all of our minds work differently. And just look at the difference. You know, we, we flew into Miami when we came back and we drove up. And just the difference in landscape, just landscape alone, from Miami Beach to Canton, Illinois, is incredible. You know, and God is creative. He's not boring. He, he's good in his creativity. And sometimes, maybe we're not as good, you know, when we get together as a church family at expressing that well. We kind of have a set way that we do things, and it's not bad. But I would challenge you that God is good and he's good at creating and he created you and that's part of his goodness and so it says that, that he he did it he he spread out the earth upon the waters he made the great lights you know and he put them up there and he did it in complete knowledge and he I think that that's crazy when you think about it it says who by his understanding made the heavens Okay, and we know very little about the heavens. Okay, and he understood it enough to make it. You see that? And so God is not just good at creating, he's also good at planning. And I just think about the natural order of things and how, how it all works, and then I wonder why that I can't like just relax about the next year of my life or how God's gonna take care of me. And I wonder sometimes, like I've had this fear in my heart, I'll, I'll tell you honestly, that has taken a hold of me and I have fought against since we moved to Africa. I think because we're so dependent on, on you all, like just for our, our daily bread and our day to day needs that it like, I just feel like sometimes if we need something or we gotta do something, like, oh, here he is again, what's he want now? And like, I know that according to the scripture that God wants us to be there and therefore if he wants us to be there, some way he's gonna make it happen. Like there's no arguing that God loves his creation. Why? Because he's good. But has anybody else ever felt like that? Like, when's his grace going to run out on me? But you see, God doesn't do that. He created, yeah, that's right. It's okay to raise your hand. I feel like that all the time. Like, when is his grace going to run out on me? But God is good at creating, and he created us for a purpose, and he's got a plan in it. He's good at planning. And we can see, like, it wasn't like he was like, hmm, stars. Oh, that's cool. I didn't even know. I surprised myself. No, it was by his knowledge. He knew what he was doing. He had a complete understanding of it. And so since God is good at planning things, and we get it displayed perfectly in creation, couldn't we trust him for his plan for our life? And that could be so relieving to us if we would put it into practice. And it's something that God is still working on me. There are days where I'm like, you know what? God's got this, and those days are good. And then there are days where I think like, oh my goodness, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, and oh, I forgot to tell this person, thank you, and they're gonna be so mad at me, you know, ah! right? And the sun still comes up the next day and the moon still shines in the sky the next night and God still has a perfect plan that hasn't been shaken at all by my doubt or struggling. But what I love about it, it goes on to talk about after creation, it talks about God, how he delivered Israel from the nation of Egypt. And uh, I guess when it says, you know, he struck down all the 
the firstborn of Egypt. Maybe I shouldn't talk about God's care, care. But, you know, God had made a promise to the Israelites. And the whole thing is crazy to me. Is, you know, Israelites, they're like not great people. That was never why they were chosen. But somehow, God heard their cry when they were in slavery. And he cared for them. And because of his great care for them, he delivered them from Pharaoh. And a lot of you know the story, right? And I think it's interesting. Sometimes we, we, we pick on Pharaoh and it's like, man, yeah, he was supposed to be a vessel of wrath. And that's true. But if you go and read that story, it wasn't until after the third plague had passed that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh actually had a chance, but God knew that he wasn't going to turn around and he, and he hardened his heart. But God cared for the Egyptians. I mean, at the end of the whole thing, they were like, just let these people go. You know, their God is, is, is kind of winning. And God cares, and that's the thing that I want to challenge you on. God cares for you when he allows affliction into your life of any sort, whether it's of your own doing or if it's not of your own doing, it's just, it's just part of life and living in a sinful world. God still cares. God really does care. And the scripture affirms that. Let's turn to 1 Peter 5, and I'm going to read a few verses from there, verse 6 and 7. And then I'll share with you just a little bit on how I know that this verse is true, how God has played it out in our life. In our life. So yeah, and struggling with this, this was a verse that I came back to. I've heard it a million times, but one day I was reading through First Peter, and this just really jumped out of me. It really touched my heart in a season of feeling like God. You know where are you at? This is just getting to be a lot, a little ridiculous. And I'm like PGing the conversation because I don't want to get fired. I, I don't know what I get fired from, but I don't want it to happen. It says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You understand what I'm saying? I think like, I love how the Bible is just so pristinely writ, written. Is writ a word? I was like, I don't know what happened. Written for us. You know, today we live in a world where anxiety is rampant, right? And it's legitimate. I, I don't know what, what really is the cause of that for us, but God was prepared for it in his perfect planning and in his goodness, and he cares. And he doesn't say like, hey, buck up. Just get over it. You know, pull up your bootstraps and go. It says, you know what, in due time he will lift you up. But the thing that we need to do is to put our trust in him, and he will do it. And casting it to him, we don't have to wonder if it's okay to do that. We can do it, and we can do it because he cares for us. Now, a lot of you don't know, and I won't go into the, the gory details, but my family, when we were here last time, split up. Just all over. All over the nation. And it was ugly, and it wasn't fun. And I have struggled for the last 10 years on why God really sent us to Africa, you know, with not a lot of, not a lot of, you know, human success in my mind in the ministry that we had accomplished. And yet, 10 years later now, as I've, I've come through everything, I realized that there were some things that I was never going to get out from under, just by myself. There were things that I, I was just still a boy, so many things, and I'm not going to explain it all to you, but like, it wasn't until being completely removed from the country, you know, that I was able to see God's goodness 10 years ago, and I was always thinking like, you know, God is only sending us there because we are awesome and the Glaro need us, right? And God's kind of like, no, we got to get you in the most remote corner of the world so you don't screw this up, you know? <laughs> and and uh, it's, just, it's funny, but there is truth to it, and I was arrogant, and thought that, you know, we had, you know, the best bulletproof family in the world. And to a fault. To a fault, really. And God brought me low, but God protected my children, you know, by being away. And I praise him for it. And I think that he can do the same thing for you. And so I just want to encourage you that, like, you know, if you're doubting the goodness of God because you feel, like, hung out to dry or left alone or just, just lonely, let me tell you that he cares for you and he's in the works of doing something good for you. And when you look back, whenever you get lifted up out of it, I promise you, you will say, thank you, God. And I'm so glad that you're good and that you care about me. 
That's what I'm doing. I'm going to get a little misty thinking about it. So let's go to the next point before it gets ugly. I don't want any snot in my mustache. <clears throat> oh, I shaved. That's good. And so I promise you that God cares for you. And if you look back at Romans, there is another aspect to it. I mentioned being arrogant. And you know, God, in his goodness, it's not always just um, tender goodness. God is also altogether good and completely perfect at judging, making judgments on our life and judging, judging us. Now, some people are like, whoa, like pump the brakes, you know, I'm not, don't judge me. God loves me. You know, I am good. I'm covered in the blood. And that's true. But God is the judge and he measures your performance based on Jesus Christ. Yet somehow there are natural consequences built into life for our actions, right? And God in his goodness has made it clear for us in scripture how we're supposed to live. And I want you to know that like some of the things that you're going through may be God letting you know that like, hey, if you continue down this road, it's the way of pain. It's a way of suffering. And in his goodness, you know, there's, there's a little bit that you're experiencing now that's hard, but if you go back to Romans 1.20, and then you read on to 21, which we'll do, you'll see it. So since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Then it says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And maybe that's the case. That could be the case for some of us. That we have not just acknowledged. Now, thankfully, he's good. But he's also a good judge. Do you know what I mean? And he has standards. And if you read on, if you read on the rest of this chapter, I'm not going to unpack it because my wife won't let me. But... Uh, yeah, that's a joke. I just no one tells me what to do, except Kayla. Now, you know that you would see very clearly that we, particularly as Americans, you know, we're experiencing some of the consequences of our choices and turning our back on God and His Word. And in His goodness, in His goodness, He has clearly marked out what needs to be done. And I want you to understand that. So not to say that hey, you got to perform to please God. But just to encourage you that like maybe, maybe you're like me. You've got some, some pride on the inside that you've never dealt with. And you're still hiding behind it. And you're wondering why you're miserable. Well, maybe examine and say, you know what, God, you're good. Thank you for, thank you for your word that teaches me like that. I, I need to look back to you. I need to obey you. And God is good in that. And the cool thing is, is that in Psalms 136, we read about all that God did for the Israelites. And we learned that, like, you know, yes, he judges, but he also fights for us. Look at all that he did for them. They were there, they, were, they crossed the Red Sea. They thought they were dead. And the first thing, that's what I love, the first thing that they said is, like, hey, you bring us out here to die? Did you bring us out here to die? But God cares, right? We already learned that. And it's like, no, check this out. And, you know. Hard to believe, but Google what you might find at the bottom of the Red Sea, and you might be surprised. Um, God is so good at fighting for his own, and he fights for you. The Bible says that he's interceding for us now, and I'm going to unpack more on that later, but I just want you to understand that you may not be able to feel it. A lot of us might feel like God is actually fighting against us, but I promise you that like, no matter how you feel, God fights for you. And yes, the blood of Jesus Christ does cover you, And he is patient. He's patient with you. And the Bible says that, that he's patient with us. Um, the other thing that, that God does in his goodness is that he teaches us. And he does it through the word of God. I hope that you're, you've heard some things that stand out to you from what we've read. But you know that Second Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed. All of it. And it's useful for what? Teaching. That's the first thing correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And then 17 says, so that the man of God is equipped thoroughly for every good work. And so God in his goodness wants to teach us. And then I love this one. 
in it all. And these all have overlap. You might, you might think I got the order wrong. And maybe you're right. But God is good at comforting us. He's so good at comforting us. It says in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You see that? And so God, in his goodness, he is ready to comfort you. And he is prepared. He has compassion on you. He doesn't want to crush you while you're down or, or kick you. Even if he's judging you to get you to turn your life around, he also wants to comfort you. And you'll learn later if you were to read in that that Paul, whatever he and the disciples went through, was bad enough that they, it says that they even despaired of life. You know, they lost the desire to live while they were on a missionary journey. And I think, in a way, it should be encouraging to us. Now, that one, maybe don't follow in their footsteps if you can you know, help it, but it happens. It happens. We're humans, and God knows it, and comfort is available because he created you. He has a plan for you. He cares about you, you know, and he's fighting for you, and he's patient with you. And so he will comfort you. And I think that's amazing, and we see that from the, the Psalms. And I wanted to give a bonus that wasn't really in Psalm 136, but it's something from the word that I had never heard in my whole life. And I want to read it to you. And it'll be my last, it'll be my last point about God's goodness. And it's in, I would like everybody to turn here so you can see this one particularly with your own eyes. It's Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. And in this, the writer of Hebrews is making an argument for Jesus as the greatest high priest. And he was writing to Jewish people who were struggling with whether or not they still needed to follow the law and the sacrificial system, if they needed to be doing these things, and um, they needed a priest. And the writer's making the argument that, no, Jesus is not only the priest, he's way better than any of the other ones that we ever had. Because he's, he's, he has the same ministry, but he's altogether different. And, uh, you know, I'm not a Jew, and so sometimes when I read things that concern them about their laws and stuff, for me, just personally, I get bored. I'm like, you know, you know. But this was so, it was something that I had glazed over in my life and I didn't realize. But in that description, it talks about what he lives for. And you guys know that Jesus is alive, right? We, we believe that. I mean, that's what we're here for, to worship him. And have you ever wondered, what, what's he doing up there? What's going on? What are you doing up there? Like, a little help? Any, anyone ever wondered? Yeah, like, like, how can you just be up there just, I don't know, chilling all the time? And don't you get tired of, like, holy, holy, holy all the time, you know? But the cool thing is, is that the answer to that is no, because he's worthy of it. He doesn't get tired of it, but there's other things going on. And in that, in verse 25, it says this, and it's talking about Jesus as the high priest. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And uh, we heard a pastor preach on that when we were in the village one day. We were watching a sermon online and it just floored me. I was like, it doesn't say that. And I went and read it. I'm like, well, my goodness, it does say that. Jesus is interceding for us. And it's not like something that he does like, oh, here's Guy again. Listen, could you get him off my case? And God's like, yeah, we're going to have to. It's not the heart. The, the verse says that he lives for it. I mean, what do you live for? You know what I mean? Like, that is his heart. That's like what gets him going. Like, I don't know that he sleeps. So I, the Bible says that I don't think he does sleep, you know, now. But like, it's like his heartbeat. That's what gets Jesus excited to be there, to interact for you to God. And sometimes I used to think, well, then, you know, God is like, Thank goodness for Jesus because God is like, you know, kind of like a little difficult, you know, being perfect and all. It was his idea from before the foundation of the world to send Jesus, that part of himself to the earth, to do what he had to do because he had you and I in mind. And so he is living. That's what God lives for. And 
I, I don't know. I wish I could describe him a little more clear to you, but isn't he good? Isn't he good? Someone clap up in here. Thank you. That's right. He lives for it. And I finally come to the point, well, at least today, I was struggling two days ago, three days ago, but I want to live for him. I want to live for him. And I would love it if I make it to the end of my life, whenever that is, and I didn't fizzle out and quit. I've been doing my best to live for the Lord since I was in junior high, and I have messed it up bad a lot of times, but I'm still here because of his grace and his goodness in my life and because he has lived to intercede for me constantly, constantly. And I praise him for it. And I want to experience more of his goodness. And do you guys want to finish well? Yeah. I want to finish well too. So I believe that like it's, it's wonderful to fill our minds with God's word and to have the truth enter into our minds and even feel the encouragement of God's word as it leaks into our heart and lifts up our spirit. But the danger is, and it's the danger for me as well, is that you get it, it it drips in there, it starts to do its work and it feels good, but what do I do with it? You ever wondered that? Like, okay, this is all good and true, but then what do I do? Anybody? Well, I'm going to give you some practical steps. God's going to give you some from his word. Jeremiah 29, 11 is like a hugely popular verse, right? About God knowing what he's got planned for us. There's a little verse after that that I love when God was talking to Jeremiah. It's 29, 13. And maybe jot this down so that you could go back to it this week. But he tells Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, there are things, promises that were made to certain people for certain things, but we know God's character. We've just studied Old and New Testament, and I know that that promise is true. Matthew says, ask, right? Knock on the door, it'll be open to you, right? So I can guarantee you that when God was telling Jeremiah, hey, you're going to find me when you seek me with all of your heart, that he is the same God, he holds the same character, and that's what he wants from all of us. So the first step is, let's seek him with all our heart. Sounds good. How do we do that? Well, Pastor Matt read a verse uh, back in July 9th, and he had already asked me to preach, and I I wrote this down that day. I'm like, I've I've got to read this. I've got to read this when we get together because it was so helpful. And I've got like a lot of bookmarks in here. Okay, here we go. And you should jot this down as well. You may have it from previous sermon. But Psalms 119.9, it says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? by living according to your word. And you cannot live according to his word if you don't know what's in his word. And so I'll kick that dead horse all day long. We have to feed ourselves with the word of God. We have to do it. And sometimes we, we, we pray for miracles and we ask for things and, and God is altogether generous and he may do those things, but his plan all along was for us to have fellowship with him through his word. I mean, this is Old Testament stuff. This is thousands of years ago, and it hasn't changed today. And so I would just encourage you in this. If you want to experience the goodness of God, you already are in some way, I'm sure, because you're here. But if you want to experience the goodness of God and you want to go deeper into that, you have to be in his word. That's what it means to seek him. And there are other parts to that like prayer, fellowship, you're here, so that's good. You get, a, you get a card, or what is it, like a green dot for that. My kids just went back to school this week, so I'm in it. And I asked Michael for permission, and I'll close it with this. I don't think he's in here, but he, uh, so it's good. If I embarrass him, you know, he won't know. No, it's not embarrassing at all. We were having a conversation, and there's some things that have gone on in my family that have just made me really worry about, like, where, where are we at? Like, where, you know? Where are people's hearts at? And I worry the same for for you guys when I think of you guys. I don't know everybody's situation, but I know, like, just to be frank, there there, there are times where I wonder, man, where's their heart really at? And I wonder for myself at times, like, guy, where's your heart at? But Michael and I were talking, and 
I was just feeling heavy hearted. This was about a month ago. And I said, Michael, do you, I just want to ask you, you believe these things just because we tell you to? Or do you, do you really believe them for yourself? And have you really seen God work in your life? And he said, well, no, I've seen God work. He said, I, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, I want you to be proud of me. So sometimes like if I believe something, then it's, you know, you're proud of me. That feels good. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I would be proud of you no matter what. Like, you're my son, so that's just, that's it. I'm proud. And I said, if you do well in your walk with the Lord, that's just an added blessing. Okay, excuse me. It's just an added blessing, but I want you to know that I would be proud no matter what, just because you're mine. And he said, well, I don't know, Dad. Sometimes I just feel like what we're doing is for nothing. Nothing's really happening. People don't really believe. He goes, but then today, when you were talking about it in church, we, we were sharing that day in another church. He said, I just got warm feeling inside and I started thinking well oh man if God if God would save Yute which is one of his friends maybe then his mom and dad would, would get saved and then if they got saved they would stop fighting with one another and, and then maybe the girls would get saved and then you know she has family in the village and I said I got, kind of got excited and then he said you know but I honestly I feel like that you remember that story about the soils I was like yeah just, I feel like the one that's just in the weeds like, I know I've got something, but I'm not doing anything with it. And I thought, like, oh, man, that, that's sad but yet amazing that, like, you know, that's going on, right? And I just thought, maybe, maybe somebody here feels like that. You know that God has a root in your life. You know that you're saved by Jesus Christ, but yet you, you got yourself among the weeds, and you're getting choked out. And then the cool story was that, you know, it, the kids went to school this week, and we were talking yesterday, and he said, uh, you know, they were asking about spiritual, environmental, physical, and mental health. And the teacher asked, like, what, uh, what is, how can you help somebody in their spiritual health? And he raised his hand, and he says, uh, well, you could ask somebody if you could pray for them. And so he's, like, really silent, you know. Like, he's like, it was awkward. They were going to give me that look. And I was laughing, and then, I so that's really cool. And he said, you know, I, I finally feel like maybe I'm doing something with what God's given me. And I thought that was really cool. And I just, it encouraged my heart as a dad, you know. So some of you might be like, oh, big deal. But for me, I was like, yes. You know, and then I, that's why I hurt my foot. <laughs> no. So I got to be careful. But you know what? I just want to bring that back. God is good. He is good. He's creative. And he created you. He's got a plan for you. He cares for you. He may judge you when you need it, but he's fighting for you and he'll be patient with you and he'll teach you and he'll comfort you and he lives to intercede for you. He lives for it. And so we're gonna close. You guys ready to rock and roll? All right, they're ready to rock and roll. But I just wanna sing a little chorus a cappella before they start. And if you wanna pull up the words to this, I was doing a verse of chorus of Is He Worthy? You guys know that song? I think it'd be good for us just to respond, just to tell him, you know what, you're worthy. Put it in our heads, and then we're going to sing about his goodness together, and we're going to sing with a little jam, and we're going to go out of here encouraged. So if you want to do it, I'll sing the first line, and you can echo. You can pull it up on Google. That's what I'm doing. I don't know if you see it, but it goes like this. It says, do you feel the world is broken? Let it rip. Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And is all, wait, or do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. And is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Yeah. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Yeah. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. That's everybody. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? And open the scroll, the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died 
to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of a blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. God, we just lift you up. We tell you thank you. And in Jesus' name, God, we want to sing about your, your never-ending love. Thank you for being good to us. You deserve what you're about to get from us, Lord, and that's praise. And we're just so thankful for your goodness, what all you've done for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Hurry up.